to the April edition of the 2016-2017 season of the New Meadows Community College History Lecture Series. My name is Michelle Miner, for those of you that don't know me. I'm going to introduce tonight's speaker for our lecture. Um, this is a gentleman who came to New Orleans some years ago, fell in love with a special lady, married her and stayed here because it was just awesome. <laughs> he has a love of New Orleans and its history. He is an author and he um, has contributed both to the New Mass History Lecture Series in the past and the Ballad of New Orleans Historical Symposium. And most recently, he, he co-tour guided with me the, um, the Battle of New Orleans historical tour, which we did for the first time this past January, which ended up being a, a big hit, and we're hoping to do it again. Um, I will, without further ado, introduce you to Mr. Donald Keith Midkiff. Um, I want to thank you guys for coming out. We're going to talk about a very interesting man that someone that very few people will know and study. Is that going to be? Can y'all hear me? No. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, Anne Louis Chalet de Toussaint is someone who was very instrumental in the Battle of New Orleans. It was a very central figure. But the way history is written, we tend to not look in the shadows very much. And the figure of Andrew Jackson tends to blot out everyone else. So um, I want to introduce him to you. And I want to talk to you about this man who served in the armies of France and America. He served in the diplomatic corps of his native France. And when I finish, I want to ask you to act as a jury for me. I want you to know, to, act, to tell me, is this man a hero or a traitor? Now, Toussaint was born into a military family. He got the very best military education. And he left the French army in 1776 to come to America to fight in the American Revolution. Anyone who studied uh, European history at this time knows that the American Revolution was like striking a match in a powder magazine. This just lit up Europe. They were so ready for change, and French particularly. The problem is that the French aristocracy didn't get the message too well. But uh, Toussaint was one of those people who rushed to America. He served with uh, General Lafayette on General George Washington's uh, personal staff and became a lifelong friend of General George Washington. He was a, a veteran of uh, many battles. And the last battle that he was in, which is the Battle of Rhode Island, and I have to confess that until I researched this man, I never knew that Rhode Island really was an island. It is in the middle of that, um, I can't say the name of it, the bad I'm sorry. I'm sorry? Narragansett. Narragansett, yes. Thank you. So, um, Narragansett Bay. And uh, so he was uh, uh, charging uh, British uh, cannons and uh, his horse got shot out from underneath him, and when it fell, it crushed his arm. He, uh, when, you, when you have your, a limb crushed, there's not a lot that the surgeries at the time could do, so his arm was amputated. Because of his valor in service to the United States, he was awarded the Order of uh, Cincinnati and given an honorary rank of Lieutenant Colonel of Lifetime Pension. When he goes back to France, the, uh, the king will give him the Order of St. Louis, and he'll rejoin the uh, French army with the rank of major. Being that he is a military man, and that there is a war in uh, Saint-Domingue, he will go to Saint-Domingue in 1784, and he'll take command of the elite regiment du Cap Francis, 
which today is Cape Patient. Hail Mary, um, love of his life, Marie Renee St. Martin in 1788, he adopts her daughter, uh, who's three years old at the time, her name is Martine, and uh, by the end of the year, uh, they have their first child together, Caroline, and then uh, Lorette is, uh, comes along in 1791. It's important to know that he has a home life in addition to being a revolutionary, in addition to being a uh, soldier. Now, the, one of the problems he ran into was that his commanding officer was a royalist at a time when that wasn't a necessarily good thing. He was arrested. Tussard felt that he was a good officer and shouldn't have been arrested. So they arrested him and they take him back to France. He stands trial for his life. He will publish a massive defense and he gets a lot of support from uh, American diplomats who are sent to France by George Washington to help defend him. He comes back to the United States. He settles near Wilmington, Delaware. His wife uh, dies in 1794, and he immediately remarries. So that blood of his life, I guess, I don't know, leading moments. Anyway, he marries a 20-year-old Anna Marie Geddes in 1795. At this time, he also enlists in the American Army and is commissioned a major in the 1st Regiment of Artillery and Engineers. And in 1800, he's promoted to a lieutenant colonel in the 2nd Regiment of Artillery and Engineers. Now, most of you know, I would think, uh, that there was a quasi-war, an undeclared war between the United States and France in 1798. It lasted until 1800, and basically we were fighting France over uh, merchant shipping in the Caribbean. So during that war, he will come and to uh, the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of War, and uh, tell McHenry, we need to have a military academy like, we had, like I had in France. 1795-1800, he'll command Fort Mifflin. Uh, it's named for a very famous Revolutionary War hero. Um, in 1801, Secretary of War will appoint him as commander of artillery. This is a post, a title that has not been occupied by anyone since Henry Knox in the Revolutionary War. Um, so then the uh, Regiment of Artillery is disbanded in 1802 and he'll resign his commission. In between, he founds a small, not very well-known school called West Point. Now he'll uh, serve, when he leaves um, service in the United States Army, he will go to Philadelphia, and he'll be the vice consul in Philadelphia for a little while. Then Claiborne writes that he shows up in New Orleans in 1806. This is actually a very important time because between 1805 and 1809, the United States was certain we were going to war with Spain. I have a feeling that the French thought so too. And they felt that it was important that a military observer be here in New Orleans to observe the war between the United States and Spain. He doesn't stay long. War fears kind of die down. Not go away completely, but they die down. He goes back to uh, Philadelphia in 1808. His daughter Mary is a very uh, rich man. This picture there, uh, John Clement Stalker. And he will publish a work that he promised George Washington he would write, The American Artillerist Companion. It's a three-volume set and it tells you everything from the design of cannons to how to make gunpowder to how to fashion cannonballs. Um, so it was the required reading of the American Army up into the Mexican War. <coughs> then he goes in, uh, to Baltimore in 1809 to secure uh, protection services for Elizabeth Patterson and her son, Jerome Bonaparte Patterson. His name is Jerome Bonaparte for a good reason. Uh, Jerome met her in Baltimore, fell in love, marries her in church, and then takes her back to France. The Bonapartes refused.
refused to allow her to step off the ship and send her packing, and Jerome has to disown uh, his marriage to her. Uh, it turns out he was only 20 years old and he was too young to marry without parental permission. But obviously the uh, Bonapartes do not want to have the son or re relation of uh, Napoleon kidnapped and held for ransom, and they turn to Tussard to handle that little problem. Now he'll come back to New Orleans in 1812 for a very good reason. We've just become a state. And he is at the Consulate de France. This is Napoleonic France. So that means that they're using a imperial eagle, the war eagle that you see up there. That's an actual wall hanging. Now, while he's here, he will um, talk to, uh, to Claiborne about being a part of a, a protection for, for France, for, for New Orleans, but using French uh, soldiers, but only as a separate body. And uh, Claiborne's a little queasy about giving him permission for that, and says, well, okay, can you tell me who you're talking about? Because Claiborne wants to check out and make sure they really are uh, French citizens and not uh, American citizens. Now, part of what's going on here is that we're dealing with the Militia Acts of 1792, which said basically every voting male has to serve in the military. I'm sure all of you guys are registered to be in the militia, and all of you have, other than Ron Chapman, you have your uh, musket. And those were requirements of the 1792. You have to spend 90 days serving in the militia, training at least once a month during those 90 days. So you have, at least you know how to stand in line, I think. The purpose of the militia was to act as a police force and a defense force for the state. Now, Claiborne will get back to Tucson about the citizenship question, and he'll say to him that, thank you very much, but I believe that everybody that was in Louisiana, when we became a state, automatically became a citizen of the United States. No need to go through the naturalization process, thank you very much. Now, Claiborne will call up the militia on December the 25th, 1813, because he's got word from Washington that the British have plans to invade New Orleans at any moment. Now, Tussard will reply to the militia call up five days later, saying that it is illegal for French citizens to serve in two armies. They cannot serve in a foreign army, and in fact, he tells them that it's actually illegal for, um, for, for the American militia and army to take aliens into its service. So he also provides a list of 22 individuals who are claiming exemption. Now, Tussard will continue his, uh, his protestations against uh, enlistment of the French citizens into the Louisiana militia. And he reminds Claiborne that American sailors and merchants and citizens in Cape Francis formed up their own American legion, if you will, and defended the, the ships and the wharves and the warehouses and the homes along the waterfront in Cape Francis. Now this young man, William Porcine, uh, it was fun to, uh, to go through the historical record and look at how many times he's trying to get out of military service. So this is September 1814, and he's saying that uh, Mr. Porcine was born in, uh, in, in Saint-Domingue. He has not been naturalized and he has not exercised any rights which may have given any of his neighbors uh, the opinion that he is a naturalized citizen. Now, Claiborne had brought over three boatloads of refugees from Cuba in 1809, 
And there was a lot of manpower in that, as well as uh, women and children, but there was a lot of manpower. So the militia requirement of the Militia Act of 1792 said, Washington can set you a quota that you have to fill. And if you can't fill it with volunteers, then you've got to draft people. And you know, draft does not go down well with Americans. But this is one of the things that's going on. And Claiborne is responding to General Jackson here. Jackson, in September of 1814, is still in Alabama, uh, concluding his uh, peace treaty with the Creek Nation. And he says, basically, we would have fulfilled our requirements if it wasn't for these ungrateful men. Now, in November, just two months later, the animosity towards Tussard has grown very bad. Um, he's been spat upon, he's been cursed, he's been called um, a traitor, he's been called all sorts of wicked things. And he's complained to the governor, and the governor is, is stepping forward and saying that um, this should not go on. One of the things that happened was that when Tussard put the fleur de lis up on his on the door of his home, it was ripped down. And then he put up a second one and he chained it even better to his, his gate and they damaged it and couldn't get it down. So remember, the fleur de lis is the, um, is the royal symbol and the imperial eagle was the republican symbol. Now, Claiborne will go further. He will write a personal letter of apology and say these acts of um, vandalism and disrespect is not the way we behave in New Orleans, and this won't go on. We will make sure that the civil magistrates will give you the protection that you need to do your job safely. So we're gonna jump forward to the Battle of New Orleans. This is uh, January 6th. At this point, there has been several engagements, and um, because of, of a particular law from 1805, uh, Tussard has not gone down to the battlefield. He knows better than to go down to the battlefield as a uh, resident alien. But what he has done is he's watched the battle from the uh, levy in front of Jackson Square. If you stand there, you can actually see the battlefield. And back then, there was no buildings in the way. There were no trees in the way. Everything was sugar cane, and the sugar cane fields had been cut, and we're just as flat as a pancake. So he's been watching the battle take place um, just four miles away from him, and he has a pretty good idea of what's going on. Remember, he was the commander of artillery for the United States at one point in time. Now what he does is he, uh, he takes great pride in the French contribution as the gunners that are uh, making uh, so much havoc with the British. And he laughs that the uh, British are confused over hearing French orders and seeing French uniforms when uh, they, they were thinking that the French were actually their allies. So he says nationalities no longer count, we are all Americans. This is a statement of camaraderie, not nationhood. We are all Americans. If you remember after 9-11, that was a statement that you saw on the news from all over, from, from everywhere in Europe, you, you were seeing those banners put up, we are all Americans now. So this brings us a little historical perspective. The first month of the Battle of New Orleans, you guys probably thought maybe it was just one day or one week. First month, Battle of Lake Bourne on 1214, 1216, Jackson declares martial law. 1223 is the night battle. 1228 is reconnaissance in force. And January the 1st, 1815 is the artillery duel. And then January the 8th is the main battle at Chalmette. The next day, the Brits begin their swamp road. 
This was a road that they cut through the swamps going back to Lake Bourne so they could get their army out in a hurry. It had to be built on top of the bogs. The bridges had to be uh, made going across the bayous and across swampy areas. And it was essential for them to evacuate what they call extrication of their army in an orderly and quick manner so that Jackson wouldn't tumble onto it and attack them piecemeal and maybe destroy or capture a large body of their army. To help with this, um, they also start shelling uh, Fort St. Philip at the mouth of the river. Our friend, Mr. Proceed again. This is the 15th of January. He says, uh, Mr. General Jackson, sir, I have been a guest of your hospitable country, and I find myself, though, against my will, registered in the army and the militia of uh, General Hopkins. And please, sir, since I'm a French citizen, grant me an immediate discharge. This will be followed up by Chevrolet de Tussard, who will write that he too believes that Mr. Corsini, just 23 years of age, is right now on the West Bank, and please, sir, uh, remedy this injustice at once. Now, on January the 19th, Jackson will write to Claiborne and say, it's over. We beat them. Basically, um, he says that last night at 12 o'clock, the enemy precipitously decamped, leaving behind him under medical attendance, 80 of his wounded. Two officers, 14 pieces of artillery, and a considerable quantity of shot, having destroyed much of his power. Whether it is the purpose of the enemy to abandon his expedition, or renew his efforts at some other point, I shall not pretend to decide with certainty. However, and this is a biggie, there is very little doubt but his last exertions have been made in this quarter, at any rate, for the present season. So Jackson does not see New Orleans under imminent invasion. And this is very important to understanding the Militia Acts of 1792 which says that the President of the United States can only take over state militia if you're under threat of imminent invasion or you're dealing with an insurrection. However, Jackson goes on to say, I shall not occasion any relaxation in the preparation for resistance. Oh, but kindly put on a nice Thanksgiving Mass at the cathedral for me, please. Which he does, which, you know, come on. Basically, this is telling the city of New Orleans, the battle's over. No more fighting needs to be done. We have seen the enemy, and he is ours. Now, by February 1815, the rest of the country knows about the victory at New Orleans. Glorious news. New Orleans is rescued. It is secure. American valor has again come in contact with the veterans of the old world, and the bloodhounds of England are destroyed. The riflemen of Tennessee and Kentucky have mown down like grass the ranks of the ferocious islanders. Immortal is the name of Jackson, immortalized in the city of New Orleans. Let no man hereafter despair of the Republic. No mention here of French artillery or French soldiers in the line. So now we come to the conclusion of month two of the Battle of New Orleans. <coughs> On January the 16th, the Brits complete their swamp road and they begin their army extraction. On the 18th, they complete the extraction and on the 19th, they end shelling at Fort St. Philip. January 19th, Jackson concludes the battle is over. On January 20th, we have the stalemate in the swamps behind the Hillary Plantation. And then we also have Thanksgiving Mass at the Cathedral. 
Now, on February 6th, there's a hint that a peace treaty has been initialed, but not ratified. And on February the 12th, the Brits capture Fort Bauer, which is protecting Mobile Bay. Again, if they had gone, if they had followed the original game plan, they would have gone to Mobile first. They would have found it to be easy to, to take Fort Bauer, and then they would have taken Mobile, and we would be talking about a totally different history today. Now, between all those events, we have the infamous order of February 28th, in which Jackson, through his adjutant general, Robert Butler, has banished all the French from the city of New Orleans. Anybody French in here? Oh, yeah. Okay. Anybody Italian in here? Yeah. Okay. Let's say that everybody who's not an Irish American has to get out of Chalmette in three days' time. Okay. That's basically what he's done. So, um, he's given them three days to get out of town, and if they're not out of town, then the officers of the, of the Army is to report to Jackson, who's still here. And then we come to that nice 1805 order, which says any, any alien in a camp without permission is a spy. We'll get to that. The commanding general has delivered with great attention on the application of Colonel Tussard requesting that the French subjects may be permitted to remain in the city of New Orleans on giving security for their good conduct. In other words, their word isn't good enough that they are reasonable citizens and defenders of the city of New Orleans. They have already fought hard. They made a crucial difference at the battle. That is not enough for them. The moment the necessity shall cease to exist, which has compelled the undersigned so reluctantly to adopt this measure, he will hasten with the greatest satisfaction to remove it. Goes so far as to let's see that. There we go. It goes so far as to put up a broadsheet on the Masperos uh, Exchange Coffee House there at uh, St. Charles, St. Louis, and uh, Charters, and uh, basically he says that under specious pretext, attempts have been made to diminish our force by withdrawing the French inhabitants of Louisiana. Sounds like Jackson's doing a fine job already. Um, so he goes on to say that a few corrupt citizens we have among us as to guard against the dangerous designs of persons not citizens, not owing allegiance to the United States. All officers and soldiers are strictly ordered and joined to enforce the said decided order of February 28th by arresting forthwith all such persons as are described therein and to confine them and make report. Now, the confinement of these individuals would be as spies, as traitors, as enemy agents in a time of war. You know how we treat enemy agents in time of war. And all officers and soldiers are strictly enjoined to give the earliest intelligence of all mutiny, intended mutiny, sedition, or excitement to mutiny and sedition, and to arrest all such persons without regard to the rank or standing of such persons. Now, two stars not over, he's a, he's a pretty brave guy, and he says, this is, a, um, this is not proper, what you're doing. And besides, I've given out 137 certificates of French nationality, which Jackson has had to countersign. 20 of these were for black soldiers, he says. Their only crime is to be recognized as Frenchmen, to start rights. Not only are they accused of being French, but spies for the English as well. A monstrous accusation against the French. The king is not, at, is not only at peace with both Great Britain and America, but allied with both as well. In this circumstance, my duty as a Frenchman and as a consul of the king imperiously commands me to protect the persons 
and honor of the subject of his majesty. Tussar closes with a man for a court hearing where he can face his accusers and demand an apology. I don't know about you, but Jackson has a reputation for facing people off in a duel. Jackson and Tussar in a duel would have been interesting. Jackson replies to Tussard, Sir, your letter this morning has just been handed to me and has confirmed in the propriety and the necessity of the imposed orders. After having admitted in my presence that you had readily granted certificates to several persons who had voluntarily enrolled themselves in the service of the U.S. and to others who made their elections in favor of American citizenship, I am only at loss to determine whether the notion of wickedness or insolence most predominated in dictating your official letter. I will, however, condescend to give you the author imperiously called for in the close of your communication. Le Chabier de Toussaint is the real author of all the dissatisfaction which has appeared among the French troops under the command of yours with candor, and, um, Andrew Jackson. So that was on the 6th. Two days later, Jackson has to back down. The Major General commanding the district has received the application of all the officers and soldiers of Major Blaschet's battalion and of Major Lacoste and Dockham, earnestly praying that the general order of the 28th Ultimate should be suspended and pledging themselves for the good conduct of the persons coming under its purview. So he basically says that because they have done so well, now these are the same French soldiers that he's banished to Baton Rouge earlier, because they have fought so well and conducted themselves so well in battle, he must give in to their demands. And he says, okay, you guys can come back, you don't have to leave, but this does not apply to the Chevalier du Toussaint who is not to be permitted to come within the lines of the camp or fortifications without special permission. So what does 137 certificates of French nationality and 20 of which were for black soldiers? Now Jackson saw these exemptions for military service as a significant number of desertions. They amounted 15% of the total Louisiana militia and volunteers as prepared by this uh, troop roster from the National Park Service. Now that up would amount to 37% of Blaschet's uniformed militia, but only 4% of the free men of color. Now if most of those 20 came out of dock hands, which is pretty likely since that was San Domingue Regiment, then uh, it would be much higher, more probably like 11% of them. But then notice that it's interesting that Jackson only backs down when his army says to back down. These troops, the Orleans Battalion Volunteers, as well as uh, at least the uh, Louisiana militia, not necessarily Dawkins militia, is back at uh, Fort St. Charles. If they had decided to make a ruckus, they were in a pretty good position to uh, make themselves heard from Fort St. Charles. Now, it's pains of getting out of hand, and I have to imagine why Claiborne waited so long to do this. But he's writing to James Monroe, who is not only Secretary of State, but he's also Secretary of War. And he writes in this letter that, uh, that the orders of the, the banishment of the French subjects have been uh, suspended at the request of the Orleans Battalion Volunteers but the French consul has been specifically commanded to retire from without the limits of General Jackson's camp, which is New Orleans. And he has, he's complied. He's also pointing out that Jackson has had the district attorney, Mr. Dip, and Judge Hall, and a uh, state senator, uh, Lavalier, uh, arrested and charged with uh, 
mutiny, inciting mutiny, sedition, treason, you, know, you name it, they've, they've been charged. What is Jackson saying here, though? I mean, Claiborne, what is Claiborne, uh, what's his real concern about this? Is that Jackson has stepped on the Second Amendment rights of the state of Louisiana, which provides that the militia answers to the governor unless there's imminent invasion. Remember, on January the 19th, Jackson said, there is no more chance that we're going to take up fighting within uh, New Orleans again, at least for this year. So now we're up to month three of the Battle of New Orleans. On February 17th, the president signs the ratified peace treaty. On the 19th, the Brits stop fighting because they've got communication coming in to them from England, which says that uh, the peace treaty has been signed by the king and ratified by parliament, uh, that a uh, copy has been sent to Washington, and the final uh, acknowledgement should come from Washington at any time. On the 22nd of February, a Charleston paper arrives announcing that the treaty has been signed by the President of the United States. The war's over. On the 28th, Jackson orders the banishment of the French. What happened between the 22nd and the 28th? 137 desertions because the war's over. And these men are French citizens fighting for one purpose only, and that is to defend their homes from an enemy invasion, not to serve in the militia of the United States. So the Lavoyer's uh, martial law protest on uh, March the 3rd. On March 5th, the Lavoyer and Hall is arrested. Now remember, Jackson knows that the war's over. He knows that there's no chance of fighting. He's been told by the commanding officer of the British that the war's over. He's still doing this stuff. U.S. District Attorney is arrested on the 8th. The Lavoyer is court-martialed. He is found not guilty, but he is not released because uh, Jackson refuses the, the, the finding of the court. On March the 13th, official word of peace arrives and Jackson ends martial law. And that effectively ends the Battle of New Orleans after three months of combat, political combat as well as, as military combat. Our friend Tussard, one of the lines I always loved in all of his protestations was that so-and-so was a subject of his very Christian majesty. So I couldn't help but put it in as the title here. Uh, so Tussard returns after martial laws are lifted, and he resumes his duties as consul. In 1816, he steps down as consul and resumes his duties as vice consul. And Jean-Baptiste Poiré once again serves as the French consul at New Orleans. He had been French consul before we became a state. His youngest daughter, Lorette, marries a U.S. Navy officer at St. Louis Cathedral on March 1816. I don't think Tussard has a lot of animus against America, not with his daughter marrying a Navy officer. And Tussard and his wife will leave for Philadelphia, and then they go on to France. He'll, he'll die soon after his arrival in Paris on March 14, 1817. He's buried in uh, Père Lachaise Cemetery. So in his 1802 letter to Thomas Jefferson, Tussard claimed dual citizenship as both a citizen of France by birth and a citizen of the United States by right of revolution and military service. He fought in some of our major campaigns. He suffered through Valley Forge. He brought in uh, new enlistments from the uh, Native Americans uh, up there, and he lost his right arm trying to capture British cannon emplacement. In his second stint in the young American army, he advanced the arts of fortification and artillery. He was a competent regimental commander of the regular army and was appointed by Secretary of War Henry Dearborn to the post of commander of artillery. He was fearless and apolitical throughout his career. He served presidents, kings, and an emperor in equal measure. 
a man of integrity, he did his duty as he understood it. As consul for France at New Orleans, it was his duty to stand for the rule of international law and protect the rights of French citizens and businesses in Louisiana. But did he go too far? Was he a hero or a traitor? Uh, we have a question. I'm sorry, what was the question? Have you ever heard of a movie called Ten Gentlemen from Westport? Is that the uh, pre-Civil War uh, movie? It, uh, with, uh, with Ronald Reagan and... It was done uh, immediately after West Point was established. The first year okay. they were established. They sent uh, so, uh, really commissioned officers out to fight the Indians. Yeah. And uh, they followed two sides tactics to the team. To the and the, the old sergeant said, oh, you can you only learn how to fight in battle. You know, you have to have experience. You can't learn that in school. Yeah, so, that's what Tussar was trying to stop. Um, now, remember that uh, artillery was the engineers. Their job was to know how to build roads, bridges, um, how to do the math involved in, in shooting a, a cannon and hitting your target. So there was a lot of... Uh, of knowledge that went into being a, uh, most of the time though, the graduates of West Point, they were really good at building roads, uh, and they, that's what they'll do out in the West for the most part, is that they will build the infrastructure that allows for the colonization of the West. Any other questions? Yeah? What was his residence? His residence, the best, my, my guess, and I haven't been able to pin it down exactly, my guess is he was right across St. Peter from the Cabildo, from the armory of the Cabildo. And because of that, because of that point. Now remember, we saw the British building the canal that was going to get them across the river. This man has gotten, he's plugged into the, to the scuttlebutt really well. And he hears about, oh, they're building the canal, they're going to get across the West Bank. He's already noticed that there's not enough American troops on the West Bank, and if they reply, they're going to be at Algiers Point, shelling the city. He's getting his family out. He doesn't think they'll take the city, but he does think they can set the city on fire. Tell us a little bit about the British line of retreat after the battle, with the hardships they went through, when they had to basically do, you know, throwing down weapons and equipment along the way. Um, you probably read Gleig's account. Yes. The campaigns of the Bullets. It's, it's an unusual book. Yes. Now remember, though, Gleig is, is not an unbiased uh, source. And, um, yeah, but how many of the sources from the British side do you have? There, there's, there's three books that I know of. Uh, Gleig is just one. But none of the British accounts are unbiased, all of them. Gleig wants to, to, to have a, 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 a repeat. Right, but he, what if he describes this guy to be the truth about the British when they out of New Orleans? He, 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 he lies about the amount of native support they have and so forth. Um, there is some, there's, there is some, there's some truth. Uh, Gleig writes, though, that they have their packs on, and one man steps off the road and falls into a bog, uh, something that we try to bring out in our tour about the, uh, the Trimbling Prairie, and he steps in a bog and he just goes down, and nobody can get near him. He's just gone. Yes, that poor wretch. So um, that road was, was essential. When they realized that they had to get out, that they weren't going to break through, their biggest fear was that they would trickle out on the road that they came, they came in about trickles, right? They came in maybe a half regiment at a time. Well, they've got to get out, um, you know, a third of their army a day. So that means they have to build this really big temporary road through a swamp. They have to cut down trees, they've got to uh, try to uh, put in field into these bogs and make something that people can get out on in a hurry. Now, Clay will write that he's in the last group of the 85th Rifles, and it's all mud by the time he, he, he and his troops are going through. But he does have time to go hunting, so what can we say? And you mentioned about the help that the Spanish gave. I mean, a lot of people don't realize the Spanish really won on our side in that battle. Remember that is written by a Frenchman. It kind of explained what's going on. You know, the Spanish in uh, Pensacola knew that the bayou was open. But when he comes 
that it, that it doesn't, there's no there's no way that the Spanish here were necessarily involved. They weren't. They were not um, as pro-American, or I should say anti-English as the French were. But they were not. Uh, they were getting some get out of uh, army free cards from uh, their consul as well. He happened to be an Irishman. The Spanish consul was Irish. His name was Morphy. We all know his, his uh, grandson, Paul Morphy, the great chess champion. But that, that was one of the, the nice things about having an Irishman as your, as your Spanish consul. He wasn't exactly uh, encouraging people to stay home and not fight. Yeah. Why didn't General Jackson lift martial law right after he determined? He should have. The law, the law said, the law said on January the 19th, he should have lifted martial law. Had he done that, we wouldn't have had all the other written war. And remember, Jackson's the only officer in the American Army not thanked by the state of Louisiana for his service to New Orleans. So if, if he had lifted martial law then, as the law required him to, as he acknowledged, they ain't coming back here. We're not under imminent invasion anymore. Jackson was afraid he was going to lose these trained troops. He put the French troops at the most difficult point of line Jackson, and he put the Kentucky and Tennesseans as far over in the swamps as he could. Any other questions? All right, thanks. Yes, one more. Um, it's quite possible. The Tucson uh, acknowledges there were 800 Baratarians, which was probably the entire population of the Isle of Barataria, which goes from the mouth of the river to Donaldsonville. So uh, that, I think, explains that large number. There was a tremendous amount of logistical service bringing weapons and ammunition to Jackson's army coming out of Barataria. That was uh, John Lafitte's main contribution. Okay. Thank you so much.